we are live. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, hope you not only enjoyed your blessings, but you remembered to share them this week. Um, welcome, everyone, to our online Sabbath celebration this morning. Um, I'd also like to extend a, a special welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. We're blessed to have a very special guest take today's service. Our guest speaker has a special affiliation with our Henderson Church family. And he was former pastor at our church and is now the president and lead pastor of the Australian Union Conference. Pastor Terry Johnson, kia ora, and welcome to our online service today. We're excited and we are looking forward to you sharing the word. May the Holy Spirit fill you and take its rightful place in our hearts as we worship together. Okay. So I'll just open us up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us for the um, beautiful day, even though it's windy and it's been quite cold. Thank you that um, we feel that spring and summer is coming along as it's starting to get warmer. Um, thank you so much for blessing us with a great long weekend as well. Please protect all of us and our families and friends. And um, for today, I just ask that you please be with the speaker of the hour, Pastor Terry Johnson. Thank you so much um, that we can fellowship with him today. Please bless him and his family. And um, as we're going through this pandemic today, Lord, I just ask that you please be with all of us, give us hope and um, help us just be able to be a big support for one another in our community. And I just ask that you please, um, please bless us and spiritually enrich us too. Thank you for, for today again, and thank you for waking us up this morning. Help us to have a great rest of the day. Amen. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, let's sing, sweet Jesus. Um, Next 
song for this morning. Um, it is well. You know, when peace like a river attendeth my, my way, when sorrows like sea billows, uh, billows roam, whatever my Lord now has taught me to say, it is well. It is well. Join us as we sing our next song this morning. May the peace speak into our hearts. When sorrows overwhelm for our life, it is our prayer that that peace will sit well with our soul this morning. Him. Um, and the theme of the song, I will trust in you. you know? Even in the darkness, you will be my light. And in the chaos, he will be our guide. It is our prayer this morning that you find our God, that God that is true to his word. Trust in you and know that you are with me forever. I confide in you because you're the only answer that matters, even in the darkness. You will be my light, even when I'm hopeless, you will be 
Amen and amen. Thank you so much for doing worship. I'm pretty sure everyone was blessed by that. So this morning we have our special guest and um, welcome all those that are watching online on Facebook and welcome those that are here with us on Zoom. So this morning we have Pastor Terry Johnson. Pastor Terry Johnson, for those that do not know you, um, what would you say to them? <laughs> well, good morning, Kiora. <laughs> And uh, Kioranna, and of course, Malo and uh, Talofa. Nice to see all of you here and to be able to say good day from, uh, from Australia. So, Axel, a few things about me. I'm five foot six, I'm 81 kilos, I'm married and have been for 29 years with two children, Kirsten, who is 23, and Alec, who is turning 18 here in eight weeks and graduating from high school. And uh, we'll be going to Avondale next year to start studying either in uh, education or theology. He hasn't quite decided where the Lord has uh, decided to lead him. Um, I was born in France to a Mauritian father and an Icelandic mother. And I grew up in Africa, Europe, United States, Canada, six years, almost six years in New Zealand. And then the last uh, 14 years here in Australia, in Perth where I was a youth director, then became a conference president, and then in Sydney, where I became the conference president as well. And uh, seven weeks ago, became the union president, like Pastor Eddie Tupai in uh, NZPUC. So uh, yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind over the last seven weeks. We've gone from uh, living in Sydney to still living in Sydney because we can't move down to Melbourne because of all the lockdowns that we're having here in Australia. Uh, and so, yeah, challenging times, but God is good all the time. 
and in, in those challenging times, what, what would be like the one message that you will give to the people right now? Look, I, I'll give the message from my personal devotions this morning. In uh, Exodus chapter 33, uh, Moses is pleading with the Lord as to how he should engage with them. And he reminds God that the thing that makes the people of Israel unique is that God is traveling by their side. And what I think we have fallen into a trap as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians, is that we believe in truth, but we may not have as strong a relationship with the truth giver as we have with truth itself. And truth can oftentimes be uh, an anchor around our hearts instead of knowing the truth giver who makes us light and makes us uh, fly, if you will, in, in the spirit. And it's so mm -hmm. good to know that um, the peace of the Lord rests upon us even in times that are challenging. These are not challenging times. These are great opportunities for the church. And that's what mm -hmm. I keep reminding folk is that uh, the distraction that we have today uh, is is really Satan's engagement to stop us from sharing the good news. Whichever side you land on, whether you believe in vaccination or not vaccination, whether you believe in COVID or not COVID, it is a distraction. And those distractions tend to divide us and God has called us to unite. And so as we unite together, the one thing that um, unites us is the belief that we have a message for the last days, a prophetic message and a message that needs to be shared wherever we can. Amen. Amen. And uh, for a one um, less serious question, what, what was your favorite church here in New Zealand that you pastored? I think I only pastored the one church there, Axel. So uh, it's, uh, it's definitely the Henderson Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, you know, it's been two and a half years since the last time that I was with you and spoke in the church service of that beautiful church that we built back in 2005. And it's so wonderful to still see it up and running. Um, the sadness, of course, is knowing that there are a lot of people who have left uh, our faith over that period of time. And of course, you know, the sadness is real because they're friends and they're friends in fellowship. And I still keep in touch with a number of them who no longer attend church. But the important thing to remember is that we're not here to judge. We're here to support people in their journey of spirituality and thank God that he is the one who judges because it's not about church attendance. It's about what's in the heart uh, that, it, that matters. Church attendance is a joy and a privilege. But if, um, if, as we see in the last days, we will not be able to worship in church, are you going to be any less a follower of Jesus? Of course not, because it's not about church. It's about, um, it's about relationship with the truth giver. <clears throat> and, and let me pray with you so you can tell the message with us. Thank you, Axel. Gracious Father, we are grateful, Lord, for, for this day, Lord, where we can worship you, Lord, and recognize you as our creator and our, and our savior, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Terry Johnson and his ministry, Lord. So far, we just pray, Lord, that as he speaks to us, Lord, that he may speak live through you and that you may speak to him and, and through him, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And thank you for that, Axel. What a blessing it is for me to be here with you and wonderful that we have this technology that allows us to be able to communicate across countries and time zones. It is 920 here in Sydney and the sun is out. It's going to be 27 degrees, probably around 28 degrees. So I'm just, I'm just sharing that with you to remind you that not every place is cold and wet and windy as has been shared. Uh, it's, uh, it's very warm here. And in fact, I've got the, the window closed because the sun is coming through from the east and it was too hot for me to actually stand in its presence. So uh, yeah, really nice to be here with you. Nice to be able to see Tessima and Emson and Baca and Dolly. And I'm sure there are others that I know as well. And to all of you who are uh, watching us live on Facebook, uh, kia ora. So good to be with you. I thought I'd share with you this morning before I come into the sermon, uh, a couple of good news stories, because it's important to be reminded that God is working, even though we may not see what he's doing uh, all the time. And to remember that he is so powerful, so powerful. But before I start that, let me just share that uh, COVID has been quite a challenge to the World Seventh Adventist Church. At the recent annual council for the General Conference, where all of the union presidents and uh, leaders of the divisions come together with lay representatives, 
uh, they shared the challenge that we have faced. Uh, almost 100,000 Seventh-day Adventists, your brothers and sisters, have died uh, during the time of COVID from COVID. And uh, just to bring it to our area, the South Pacific Division, Fiji has lost a significant number of uh, church members. PNG at the moment is really struggling with COVID. And of course, you can recognize that they don't have the same kind of medical coverage that we have in New Zealand. They don't have the same kind of medical care that we have in Australia. And that means that the prime minister, who is a Seventh-day Adventist, um, uh, James Marabe, is, uh, is challenged by what is going on in his country at the moment. And if you have time to pray, make sure that you do that, because God tells us that true religion is in how we care for those who are in a more impoverished situation than we are in. And so when we're thinking about uh, our own perspectives on COVID, let's remember that we have lost a significant number of people across the world church. And whichever position you are in, just remember that uh, God loves both sides of the argument and that at the end of the day, the most important thing is the unity of the church. So let me just tell you a couple of stories. In Melbourne recently, there was a Seventh-day Adventist church that actually uh, invited the local Muslims to come and use their church building because the Muslims had been denied a permit to build a mosque. And so they did not know where they were going to worship. And the Seventh-day Adventist church actually decided that they would challenge themselves by inviting uh, Muslims to come and worship on Fridays, which is their day of worship, in the local Seventh-day Adventist church. They had no idea what kind of a blessing that was going to be. So when the Muslims came and joined in the church, the Muslims saw that the church needed to have new carpet. And so a Sabbath later, when the Seventh-day Adventist church showed up for church on Sabbath morning, they came to a church that had been completely recarpeted with brand new carpet from top to bottom, uh, paid for by the Muslim church, uh, by the Muslim mosque members. Uh, and uh, they got involved with the Seventh-day Adventist Church and refurbished the entire church because they were so grateful that a Christian denomination would be interested in their own uh, welfare, in the welfare of the Muslim people, uh, even though they were so far apart in terms of theology. Part of that story has become so well known in Melbourne that a young Seventh-day Adventist member of, uh, of a church, of one of our Seventh-day Adventist churches, was in a cab, was in a taxi going to a destination in Melbourne. And as taxi drivers do, they ask a lot of questions. And of course, one of the questions was, what faith do you belong to? And of course, the young lady said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist member of the Protestant denomination. And immediately the cab driver pulled over to the side of the road and stopped. And he said to the young lady, there will be no charge for this taxi ride today. And the young lady said, why not? He said, because of the love and care that your church has shown to my people. And as a result, I just wanna thank you and bless you by not having you be charged when you drive in my cab. I love that. Isn't that what God calls us to be? You know, that kind of people. Let me tell you about a 13 year old girl a 13-year-old girl who is the, the daughter of Mr. Leo Barreto. Leo is a member here in Sydney, and his daughter, her name is Isabel. And Isabel went to our Adventist high school in Auburn. Well, not high school, primary school in Auburn. And when she graduated from our primary school in Auburn, her parents wanted to keep her in the area, and so they sent her to Trinity Catholic School, which is, of course, quite different from our school. And she wanted to know, she said to her father, what should I do to share my faith with my teacher? And his fa uh, her father said, how about you uh, use one of the good books that we have from the ABC? And so she went to the ABC and she found Dr. Ross Morton's book on Live More Happy. I don't know if you've seen that, the yellow book that says Live More Happy. It's fantastic. It's really on the concept of New Start and how to deal with mental health issues. A brilliant book that's been very well featured all around Australia on all of the news media uh, and television stations, and Dr. Morton is quite well known. So she took the book and she gave it to her teacher, and her teacher loved it, loved it so much that the teacher went to the principal of Trinity Catholic School and said, um, you need to read this book. The principal read the book. 
he loved it so much that he came and called the Greater Sydney Conference Adventist Book Center and said, hi, I'm the principal of Trinity Catholic um, High School. I'm wanting, I'm wanting to know if it's possible for me to purchase a few of the Live More uh, books by Dr. Ross Morton. And the Greater Sydney Conference ABC manager said, of course, how many would you like? He said, I'd like to have 130 copies to give to every single one of my staff uh, because the book has been so helpful to me that um, I think that it's gonna be a blessing to them as well. So they're in the middle of Auburn, which is a predominantly <clears throat> Muslim community, is this Catholic high school where every teacher has received a copy of a book that is opening up their hearts uh, to the steps to Christ and to the desire of ages. And uh, what an opportunity to think that a 13 year old girl uh, took that on and decided to share with her teacher. One more story <clears throat> before I bring this to a close. And that is the story of uh, Leslie and Louise who belong to the Ride Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, here in Sydney. And the Ride Seventh-day Adventist Church decided that they wanted to get involved with the program, and some of you have seen it, of Mums at the Table. I don't know if any of you have actually seen that program, but it's produced by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it's got over 10,000 women who have connected with uh, this program uh, online in social media. All of them not Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, the, the members of the Ride Seventh-day Adventist Church decided that they needed to actually connect with these women. And so they started a mums at the table play group in the local church. And they invited uh, the women who were in their area who belonged to these 10,000 people to come and join. And so they came and when they came, uh, they had 30 non Seventh-day Adventist moms with their children showing up for a play date every single week to connect with the members that they knew online but had never met face to face. And that has made a huge impact on the church. So the church started to think, well, how do we actually involve these folk with church programs other than the Wednesday morning uh, Mums at the Table program? Well, they brought them to church on Sabbath morning for a branch Sabbath school class. And just before COVID, more than 30 of those families actually showed up to church on Sabbath morning to do Sabbath school for their children uh, because it was a spiritual thing that they were interested in connecting with. I tell you what, brothers and sisters, it may be challenging to be meeting like this instead of meeting face to face, but it's making a huge impact. I wanna just share that in Greater Sydney, every single Sabbath, the conference used to have 6,900 people showing up in church on Sabbath morning. But since COVID in March of 2020, the Greater Sydney Conference actually has more than 25,000 people watching their programs online every single Sabbath. I want you to think about that. Because sometimes when it feels like there's only a few of you in church, you never know how many people are watching live on Facebook and how many people are actually watching the program day in and day out after that. So be encouraged and know that God is still f working very, very hard in, uh, in society, whether it's in Auckland or whether it's in Australia, uh, wherever the Lord may be, that is where we want to be as well. Let me share my screen with you and we'll just have a word of prayer here in a minute as I um, start this. Uh, let's see, can you see that? We're all there, excellent. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for who you are, for the blessing that you give us by being in our lives, for the anointing that you place upon us as well, for the challenge that you give us to continue to serve you and to worship you and to share the good news, to not be distracted by what happens around us, but to be reminded that all things work for good for those who love and trust in the Lord. We pray this in your name, Jesus, as we open the word and worship you in your name. Amen. Come with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20 to 28. But before we get there, I'm going to tell you a story. And it's going to be a fairly long story. And then we'll hit the main points from Matthew chapter 20 as soon as, I, as soon as I'm ready there. The first thing is that back in 1994, Kimberly and I uh, needed to go to Andrews University. We had finished our university degree and the Texas conference had decided that they were going to send us to Andrews University to get our master's degree. And there were three of us, 
three pastors that went to Texas at this, uh, from Texas to Andrews at the same time. Uh, Pastor Lane Campbell, uh, Pastor Ingo Sorke, and myself, and Lane's wife, Amy, and Ingo's wife, Nancy, and all three of us went to Andrews University uh, to, to get the master's degree. And we were quite excited about it because uh, we had graduated from university at Southwestern Adventist University at the same time. We had been employed by the Texas Conference at the same time, and we had been working as interns for two years before they sent us to Andrews University. And this is one of the preeminent universities for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the world. And if you are aware of the Ivy League schools in America, Andrews University is just below the Ivy League schools. So it's not like Yale, it's not like Harvard, but it has a very good reputation for academic excellence and in particular for spiritual academic excellence. And so it was a joy to go and they sponsored us to go up there. And we were privileged to actually be with a whole bunch of students from around the world. Uh, there were about 600 students at Andrews University just in the seminary. And the seminary teaches all kinds of, uh, of, of um, techniques in how to, sh to share, to be evangelistic, et cetera, et cetera. And so we were there in those classes. And of course, the first year students, when you get up there, you're actually assigned to a church. And I was assigned to Pioneer Memorial Church, which is the university church on campus. And on any given Sabbath, there are about 2,500 people who actually worship in this church. And you will know this church simply by the main speaker of the church, whose name is Dr. Dwight Nelson, and many of you have heard Dr. Nelson's sermons, and he was the pastor when I was there. He's been the pastor there for almost 30 years and has done a brilliant job, and you can see how large this church is in terms of its structure. And let me give you an overhead view of how big this church is, and you can see that it can seat 2,500 people without too much trouble, and underneath the church is a basement level. You can see down there, if you look at the, the, the ground of the main sanctuary, that there's some dark windows. Those dark windows are actually the opening into the lower level of the church where there are many Sabbath school classes and of course the administrative offices. So it was my privilege to actually work at Pioneer Memorial Church and every Sabbath, I was involved with the worship service, leading out in songs and it was brilliant to be able to actually have the fabulous musicians available to us, musicians who were stunning in their ability, orchestras and, and uh, worship teams, you know, very, very similar to the lovely music uh, that we had this morning. Thank you, family, for, uh, for sharing that. Good stuff. And when it came to the time for us to graduate in December of 1996, Pastor Dwight Nelson invited Kimberly and I to come to the front of the church so that the church could say goodbye to us after two and a half years of working there as student pastors. And as he was talking to us, he asked us the question, he said, Pastor Johnson, where are you going to be going in the Texas conference now that you're leaving Andrews University? And I knew that he knew where we were going because we had told him where we were going and he had had a good laugh at the time. And so he was having a bit of laugh at our expense at the time uh, because of uh, what was going on in terms of uh, his, his enjoyment of the situation. Well, this is a map of the United States and where the red uh, dot is, is where Andrews University is in Berrien Springs, Michigan. It's quite a long ways from where you see Texas down at the south there near the Gulf of Mexico and of Mexico itself. And Texas Conference is where I was employed. And so it was the Texas Conference that was inviting me to come back down to Texas to be a pastor in their conference again after my master's had been done. And so uh, Dwight knew this and he said, so wh where are they sending you, Terry? And I had to share with him that I was going to be going from a church of 2,500 people every Sabbath with beautiful music to a church that was a little bit further uh, from that reality. So this is Texas with the right red mark. And there in the eastern part of Texas was where the Texas conference was going to send me. They were sending me to a little church called Marietta, Texas. And Marietta, Texas, is three hours to the east of Dallas-Fort Worth. If you can see on the map, Dallas-Fort Worth is there. And south of Dallas-Fort Worth is where Southwestern Adventist University is located. Of course, many of you would know the town that's south of Dallas-Fort Worth called Waco because it was the scene 
of the tragedy of Waco in 1993, where 97 people were killed by fire uh, after following Mr. David Koresh. So there is the church to the east of Mount Pleasant. And if you can see, there's a little square, a little red dot where the church is. Uh, and it was 40 minutes away from the town that you see on the left-hand side of the screen called Mount Pleasant. And Mount Pleasant was the only place where you could actually purchase any food. It was a tiny little town. This is the town of Marietta, and, it, and that's today. That was not back in 1993. This is a picture of today, and you can see that the town still is very small. Kimberly and I lived on 7th on Stevens Drive, sorry, you can see that there in the northern part of the town. And the town had 162 people living in it. Of the 162 people, 90, uh, sorry, 110 were going to church at the Oak Ridge Baptist Church. And you'll note that there is no indication here of where the Seventh-day Adventist Church is. And Dwight knew that the church was actually quite a long ways away from town. And the reason for that is that the church back in 1997 was a church that was celebrating its 100th year anniversary. And so in 1897, when the church was first started, Seventh-day Adventists were considered to be part of a cult, and therefore they could not actually build their church in the center of town. So instead, the church had to be built outside of town by some significant distance. And you can see there in the top right-hand corner of the map that the Marietta New Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church was not in the center of town. This was the town that the Texas Conference was sending me to in the middle of Outback, Texas. There's very few people in Texas in that area. And this is the way that it looks today. Uh, and so you can imagine that uh, 30 years ago, it looked just as bleak and actually very few uh, people around. Beautiful area, stunning, lovely, lovely people. And this is the Marietta, Texas church that the conference was sending me to. So I had to share with Pastor Dwight Nelson and the 2,500 members of the Pioneer Memorial Church that the conference was sending me to a little church that had nine church members. Nine church members, and the youngest church member was 58 years old. My wife and I were 27 at the time, and the youngest was 58 years old. They had one musician, and the musician was Auntie Rose, and Auntie Rose played 28 hymns, and that was all she played. She did not know 29, she did not know 30, she only knew 28 hymns, and so therefore every Sabbath we had to rotate from the same hymn sheet, and quite often the church members would pray that Auntie Rose would be sick that Sabbath so that we could sing some different songs a cappella. That was the environment that we actually went to. It was also quite a very difficult environment because being in East Texas, it was quite racist. And my skin color at the time was darker than it is today. I actually looked like a Mexican and still look like a Mexican. And so the church members told me when I first got there, Pastor Johnson, you cannot visit our church members. Well, I said, well, there's only nine of you. Uh, <laughs> how hard is this going to be? And they said, no, you, you can't, you don't understand. If you come and visit, uh, people will actually take out their shotguns and they will force you off their property because they believe that you will actually be there to steal their goods because you look like a foreigner. Fascinating. And so we were trying to figure out what to do in that church. And fortunately, the head elder, who was a member of the Shriners, and if you are aware of who the Shriners are, they're a member of the Masons, uh, he was a member of the Masons, and, uh, and he said, Pastor Johnson, I'll take you to all the houses, and we will make sure that you will be safe as you actually uh, share the good news. It was quite an incredible thing. So here I went from a church of 2,500 to a church of nine people, and it was a shock to the system to go from the music and the beauty of worshiping with that many people to the lack of music, the lack of creativity with a church of nine people. And I can tell you that it was confronting for me as a young pastor. What do we do? My wife and I were challenged because 
we had two friends, Ingo and Lane, who were graduating at the same time, and they were sent to churches like this one. Lane was sent to the Fort Worth First Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the Fort Worth First Seventh-day Adventist Church was where Kimberly and I had been involved as interns, and it was where Kimberly and I had actually gotten married. So back in June of, 20, of 1993, Kimberly and I were married in that very church where my good friend Lane Campbell was actually the minister. And so we wondered, where is the Texas Conference thinking that we're going to go if they're not willing to send us to a church of significance like this? And this one here is the Scenic Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church in San Antonio, where my good friend Ingo Sorke was sent as a pastor. And we were sent to this church. And so we asked, Lord, what are you doing with us? Lies we tell ourselves, brothers and sisters. We try and make ourselves better by the titles that we have, by the church sizes that we have, by the jobs that we have. You start a conversation with any man, and um, the first topic that normally comes up is what they do for a living, because everybody wants to measure themselves as to how well they're doing compared to the other person. And this is very true across the world. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. There is always the sense of who is better than the next person. Let me just tell you very quickly that the time that we spent in this little church were some of the best times that I can remember outside of being the pastor of the Henderson Church, naturally. And it's because in this little church, we discovered how to do ministry that was meaningful. That little church of nine people grew in one year from nine people to 42 people attending church. I didn't have a single baptism in that one year, but we started 15 Bible studies. And the Texas conference at the end of that year sent me to another church where we stayed until we moved to Henderson, New Zealand. And in that one year, growing from nine to 42, those church members took on the responsibility of the 15 Bible studies that we had started and they finished them and three people were baptized into the church. The first time that they had had baptisms in that church in years. It was encouraging to them and it was encouraging to my wife and I as well. And that's why it's important to come to this wonderful story in scripture. Now, many of you will know this story because it's a story that you have read quite a few times. It's a story that we always talk about because it's a story of a mother who wants, wants to share uh, the blessings of God's kingdom with her sons. So here's how the story begins in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 to 23. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, she asked a favor of him. What is it that you want, he asked. And she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink, he asked the boys. And they answered, we can. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant, for these places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Now, there's some very interesting things to be thinking of as we take a look at this Bible verse. Keep your hand there in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 to 23, and let me share with you who the, the mother of the sons of Zebedee were, was. This is Salome. Of course, this is not a picture of Salome because we don't know what she looked like, but this is a picture of a young mother in the Middle East, and she's representative to me of what Salome may have looked like. Salome is the name of the mother of the sons of Zebedee. You've always known her as the mother of the sons of Zebedee, but she's actually mentioned in a couple of places. When you look at Matthew chapter 27 and Mark chapter 15, mark these texts down and look at them later, you'll note that the same group of women is actually mentioned. In one, they are mentioned by name. In the other, they're not, but the same people are connected 
In one, she's mentioned as Salome. In the other, she's mentioned as the mother of James and John. And so we can make the connection that her name was actually Salome. We also need to make the connection that her husband was wealthy. Because if you remember that when Jesus actually came down to the Sea of Galilee and he said to James and John, follow me, their father never objected. And their father didn't object because their father probably had more than two sons. And their father had a very wealthy business of fishermen uh, and fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. And she was a well-to-do woman because the Bible actually says that there were a number of women who followed Jesus around throughout his three-year ministry who provided for Jesus his food and his clothing and a place to rest and stay while he didn't own a home, which is why he said that the Son of Man only has stones to sleep on. He did have access to people who were caring for his daily needs and for the daily needs of his disciples. And the Bible says it was these women, these women who were very strongly supportive. So she comes from a wealthy family. She comes from a family that was actually influential as well. Uh, and I'll show you that here in a moment when we come to the life of John. She was a friend of Jesus. And further to that, not only was she a friend of Jesus, she was probably Jesus's auntie. She was more than likely related to Mary. We're not sure exactly how, but we believe that she was actually um, uh, related to um, Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And there's been quite a lot of research that has been done by Seventh-day Adventists at Southern Adventist University in the Theology and History Department to see if this is true. And they've been able to find some connections. And so when um, Salome comes before Jesus, she's coming as his auntie, which is why she, he, she, Jesus does not condemn her, but he treats her with respect when she makes her request. She comes on behalf of her sons, and that tells us that they were young and unmarried because you would not go to the leader on your own if you were unmarried and if you were under a certain age, your mother had to actually come and do it, even though James and John were related to Jesus. So Salome comes to, to Jesus to request this amazing request. Jesus treats her with respect, a respect for a woman, first of all, and a respect for an auntie, a respect of the mother of his cousins. But he recognizes that what she wants, he cannot give. And so he asks the boys, are you willing to drink of this cup? And when you think about, are you willing to drink of this cup? He was actually saying to them, are you willing to be poured out as a drink offering until it has been finished because you only live once? And so therefore the decisions about your career, your friends, your partner, are you willing to submit them, to surrender them to me in order for me to fill you and if I fill you, are you willing to be poured out like a drink offering, which I will be poured out as well? I need you to remember that this is very, very close to the time that Jesus goes to Gethsemane and ends up being poured out on Calvary as a result of his desire to save all of humanity. And so when he was talking to James and John and saying to them, are you willing to be poured out? He was actually reflecting on what he was actually going to do. And he told them, you cannot sit at my throne on my left and right because it's not up to me to make the decision. But if you're willing to drink of the cup, this is what is going to happen to you. And this is what happened. I'll share with you just before I get to that, what happened with the disciples. The disciples did not like this at all. They hated this. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And let me tell you that the reason that they were indignant is because they did not think of it first. If they had thought about bringing their mother with them to Jesus, then they could have asked the exact same question. So they're angry with James and John because they think that James and John are trying to skip the line and get better outcomes than themselves. And remember that in Matthew chapter 18, just two chapters before, in Matthew chapter 18, the Bible actually tells us that the fight that they were having was who will be the greatest. And Ellen White tells us in the book Desire of Ages that it was Judas who was actually 
fomenting the conversation. He was the one who was saying, hey, listen, who, who is the number one uh, behind Jesus? Shouldn't it be the treasurer who is number one behind Jesus? Shouldn't it be me, Judas? And of course, from there, the fight was on. And so when James and John, with their mother Salome, come to Jesus to chat with Jesus, these folk are indignant. And listen to what Jesus actually tells them, and remember this in your daily life. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but that is not the way that it's supposed to be with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must first be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So just as the Son of Man was willing to come out and be poured out as a drink offering, can you drink of this cup? That is what God is calling each one of you to, each one of us. It doesn't matter if you're a union president or a conference president or a pastor or an elder or a deacon. There is no rank. There is no hierarchy. There are just roles that God asks us to play for a certain period of time. And as long as we're connected to God, led by the truth giver, then we will be poured out as a drink offering. So those disciples who were young, James and John, 21, 23, 24, whatever age they were, they were asked, are you willing to drink of this cup? And they said without a hesitation, yes, we are. And when they said that, I don't think they actually understood what it was going to mean until they saw Jesus crucified on the cross. So what happened to them? This is the story of James. The book of James chapter 15, sorry, the book of Acts chapter 15 tells us that James was the first leader of the Christian church. He was the one that actually brought together the Christians in the council of Jerusalem. And he was the one who said, it seemed good to me, uh, to us and to the Holy Spirit, that we should only require certain things from you as Gentiles as you join the church. He was the one that brought together the people and the disagreement and came out with a solution that was going to work well for the new church. And we are told through history that he was beheaded in the city of Jerusalem where he remained until his death around the year 44. So around 14 years after Jesus died, John, sorry, James is then beheaded. He would have been 38 years old. And he was poured out as a drink offering because he said he was able to drink of the cup that Jesus said, are you willing to drink from? Are you willing to drink from the cup? Are you willing to actually be poured out as a drink offering, as a servant, as a slave to everyone, serving the kingdom of heaven? The life of John is slightly different. His younger brother, James's younger brother, he wrote five books in the New Testament, as you know. He was considered the beloved G uh, disciple of Jesus. If you come to John chapter 18, we're not going to go there, but take the time this afternoon to read it. When you come to John chapter 18, you recognize that when Jesus is confronted by Caiaphas and Judas and he is taken into prison, they bring him first to the house of Annas and then to the house of Caiaphas, and John and Peter follow Jesus, and when they come to the house of Caiaphas, John is able to go directly into the house without having to knock on the door. Peter stays on the outside, but John goes into the inner courtyard, and then he comes back out with permission to bring Peter in, and the reason that John was able to go in is because of the influence of his mother and the influence of his father. Not only were they financially influential, but they were more than likely connected to the house of Caiaphas and therefore more than likely of the tribe of Levi and therefore part of the priesthood of the time. And when we think about that, we start to realize that this young man had connections with a lot of people and that he was able to step into places where a lot of the disciples would not be allowed to step in. And with his permission, Peter comes in. And the Bible doesn't tell us, but we know from the fact that the book of Revelation was written around the year 93 or 95 AD, that tradition and history tells us that John died probably 
about five years after leaving Patmos and most likely in the city of Ephesus in the land of Turkey that we know today. But before he died, he wrote something quite astounding. Come with me to Revelation chapter 3 and verse uh, 21. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, you know it well because it is written to the church of Laodicea and we as Seventh-day Adventists have always seen that the church that is apathetic, unwilling to do anything, is neither hot nor cold, is the church that represents Christianity, represents us in the days before the Lord returns. And notice these wonderful words that John wrote in chapter 3, verse 21. And keep in mind that his mother was the one who said, grant that they sit at your left and your right when you return. And notice how John reads this. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. And the Bible says this. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. John, by the time that he gets to 95, and he's probably in his 90s at this, at this time, is able to understand that the only way that he will be allowed to sit by the throne of God is if he overcomes through the power of the blood of Jesus. And he recognizes that he is not able to demand a seat, that his mother couldn't demand a seat, even though she was the auntie, but that only those who overcome will actually be able to sit at the throne of God. Come on, brothers and sisters, is that not a shout for amen? And look at what John, um, his friend, says. The, this is the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. And I, I wanted you to connect this, this idea of, a, of a, a drink offering that Jesus actually said, are you willing to drink of my cup? The idea of a drink offering and bringing that into context of he who overcomes. And look at what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And so there's this understanding that to those who overcome, they overcome because they're poured out as a drink offering on a daily basis. They drink of the cup that Jesus said, can you drink of my cup? And when they drink of the cup and they pour themselves out, they are constantly refilled because they're drinking of the cup on a daily basis. They're gaining the word of life, the water of life. So the bread of life, the water of life is filling them. And as they're filled out and they pour it out, they are then overcoming through the blood of Jesus. So John got that. He didn't get it when he was 21. He didn't get it when his mother was actually speaking to Jesus. He got it as he got older and he starts to realize. Now remember that John had not experienced a martyrdom like his brother James, but he had lost his brother. He had lost a lot of the church members who had believed. He had seen the church go from new, young, full of miraculous signs to a church that was persecuted, to a church that was struggling to keep its authenticity, to a church that was really challenged by trying to maintain its holy connection with God. It was a church that was accepting of pagan beliefs by the time that John died. And so he died having seen the church with all of its beauty to all of its challenges as people struggled to maintain their connection with God. And as he sees that church, he says to that church, to him that overcomes, will I give, will I give. Now I come to this last verse, which is the same one that we read a bit earlier, to remind you that it's not about position, it's not about education, 
It's not about job. It's not about being an elder. It's not about being a deacon or a pathfinder leader. It's not about being the pastor of the church like Axel is. It's not about being the conference president of uh, North New Zealand or the union president and Pastor Eddie Tupai. It's not about any of those things. It's about whether or not you want to drink of the cup of the Lord. And if you recognize what that means, whoever wants to be first must first be your slave. Whoever wants to be great must first be your servant because to drink of the cup of the Lord means that you need, need to be like the Lord, poured out like a drink offering, faithful to the end. To him that overcomes, I will give the right to be with me on my throne. Those who have ears, let them hear the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, as we consider these amazing words, I, I, wish, I wish I had met Salome, but I'm looking forward to meeting her in the kingdom. And so, Lord, I'm looking forward to meeting everyone who is hearing this sermon as well, that they will be faithful to the end. To him, to her that overcomes, will I grant the right to sit at my throne. Lord, you called us to service. You called us to care, to empathy, not to position, not to title, but to being the hands and feet of the kingdom of God. So we pray, Father, on this your Sabbath day, that you'll remind us again of the joy that comes from being in your service that you'll fill us with a renewed sense of mission and of purpose, and that you will give us the strength to be poured out as a drink offering day in, day out, until you return. May we by faith believe that we have overcome through the blood of Jesus. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry Johnson, for sharing with us. Um, just a reminder, next week we have our Pastor William Iridua preaching for us. So he'll join us next week at the same time. And God bless you all and have a lovely day. Bye-bye.